25. And as we've made our way to Easter the last month or so, we've been looking at Old Testament passages for these moments where God says, never again to us. You see, so often during Easter we focus on the New Testament passage, passages, you know, depicting the, the passion scenes and the love of Christ. And that's awesome. That's great. But what we have to realize and understand is when the, when the apostles went about telling the world about Jesus in the beginning, they didn't have these gospel stories. They didn't have it written down. But what they did, what, the way they shared was they would go to these Old Testament passages. Where God said, never again. And they would use that to tell the story of what they saw. And what Jesus did for everyone. And so that's what we've kind of been doing through this, this, these past several weeks. Is kind of following that journey. And so our passage today has us in the book of Isaiah. And this is, a, this is a passage with a message of hope for a people that were in the middle of a very dark situation. A, a, it's a group of people that are looking for a reason to have hope. Because death and hardship surrounded them. And I don't know about you, but I feel like this passage is still relevant for us today, in our time. That message of hope that Isaiah penned for, for God's people is still relevant to us now. So Isaiah chapter 25, and we're going to read verses 6 through 9. It says, On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich, rich food for all peoples. A banquet of aged wine, and the best meats, and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples. The sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. And in that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. <coughs> this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So verse 6 tells us that God, the Lord Almighty, is going to a feast. Why do we have feasts? Why do we, we eat together these big meals? It's usually always in celebration of something. Am I right? You got that big promotion at work. So when you do you and the family get together, you go out to eat, you celebrate. Your kid gets straight A's on their report card. When you do, you go out to eat, you celebrate. what we do. We get together and we eat. Now in the ancient world, whenever a major battle was won, whenever a war is fought, and one side emerged victorious, they would always sit down and have this ginormous feast to celebrate the victory. So God is, God is, is throwing this feast and sparing no expense to celebrate his victory of something. He gets the best meats. And he gets the best non-Nazarene approved beverages he can find. Some of you got it. <laughs> he doesn't spare any expense because why? Because God has done something amazing and incredible, and it is something that should be celebrated, something that should be rejoiced over. And God isn't throwing this feast just for himself. He's not doing it to just pat himself on the back. No, God is having this feast and inviting everyone to come participate in his victory celebration. See, it says there in verse 6, it says, A feast of rich food for all peoples. So he is inviting everyone from everywhere to come to his table and celebrate with him his victory. God's throwing this big shindig for everybody. Why? What, 
what, what did God do that was so great that, that we should that He wants everybody to come and party with Him about? It has to do with this, this, this article of clothing that's talked about, verses 7 and 8. It talks about this shroud that holds all people. What is a shroud? Well, it was, it's a commonly used article that is a clothing that is placed over the head of a person who is condemned to die. They are being, they, if the bag is placed over their head, they are led, and, and they are led to their place of execution. So that one, they, don't, they, they are not able to get a good grasp of their surroundings. They're unaware of everything that's happening around them in preparation for the moment that, that, that they're coming to. It kind of keeps them from seeing everything as it should be. And the reason that people wear this, and most of the time they're being executed, is because they have committed some type of crime. They have done something wrong. And this is their punishment. They are wearing the shroud over their head, marching to the gallows, to the, the, the firing range, whatever it is, because they have done something wrong and are and they've been deemed worthy of death. And so now this shroud covers their head. So here in this passage, this, this death shroud, this shroud, this, 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 this tool of death, Isaiah writes that it is what involves all people. Every single person is covered with this death shroud. <coughs> Wearing this shroud over their head, walking to the moment of their execution.
Matter of fact, Isaiah, he writes this passage. He's telling us, this is a, a, writing this as a message of hope. He's telling us to rejoice because God is defeated death, but yet Isaiah himself dies. This makes no sense to us because the shroud of death blinds us to the truth. You see, death is the shroud that keeps us from seeing things as they really are. Think about it. If you, go, if you take any biology class, they're going to teach you about this, this thing called survival of the fittest, aren't they? And that, that tells us that the only the strongest will survive. Those who are the smartest, the fastest, the most courageous, they will survive. But if you're weak, if you're not smart enough, if you're not good enough, then you're going you're gonna to die. So our entire world operates under this shroud. Trying to avoid the inevitable. Trying to keep that one final event from happening. Think about us in our own lives, how that affects the decisions we make. The shroud of death covers over us, and, and it dictates to us what we eat, the activities we do, how we spend our lives. It blinds us to the truth. It looms over our entire existence. But we, we've actually, it's gotten to a point in our lives where we, where we stop noticing it. We don't realize that it's actually there. It's, it's just, we've been wearing the shroud over our heads for so long that we're just used to it now. We've grown accustomed to it. We don't realize that there is more beyond the fabric that's covering our eyes. We don't realize that there, there's any hope beyond what we know and what we see. All we see is the darkness. Because it covers us and it's in, inside us as a part of us. We all know the story of how death came into play, don't we? As Adam and Eve, God created and he formed, he formed mankind out of the dirt. He breathed his life into them. He sat them in the garden with the tree and said, there's, there's you can eat from anything you want in this garden. I have provided absolutely 100% everything that you will ever need. So the only thing is you can't eat from this one tree. And what they do, they eat from the one tree. They knew the will of God and they, did, they willingly made the choice to disobey what God told them to do. They sinned against God. And because, of, because God is holy, sin cannot be in His presence. And I've told you guys this before. So often you hear the saying that God is holy, therefore He cannot be in the presence of sin. No, that's wrong. God is almighty and all-powerful. God can go wherever He wants to go. And there is nobody that's going to stop Him. Sin is not more powerful than God is. No. Sin cannot be in the presence of God because God is so holy and so perfect that it will be consumed by His holiness. It's because of Adam and Eve's choice that brought death into the world. That decision to sin is, is what brought this shroud that covers over everything that we do, everything that we are, and it blinds us to the truth of what's really out there. What's really happening? And not only did it did sin separate them from some separate Adam and Eve from God, though, too. Notice it separates us from each other. Think about it. whenever you lie or you cheat or you steal or you do something that you know is against the law of God, it never just impacts your life. It always impacts everyone around you. Sin is why we have walls up between one another. Sin has taught us 
to not trust one another. It's taught us to not trust the systems that we've built to help one another. That's the shroud of death looming over everything. And to make matters worth, death has it so trapped and so, so inoculated to its existence, a shroud over everything, that we feel like we're trapped and there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. We feel trapped that there is no way out, that there is no hope, that there's only darkness, and darkness is all that there ever will be. And it leads back to that old theory of evolution that says survival and fist. I gotta be the strongest while I can and survive as long as I can because once I once once I get to that part where I'm not the strongest, the smartest, or the wisest anymore, then, then I'm gonna take my last breath and be no more. Death comes over everything. But the passage today, it tells of a time when God is preparing a feast. Where he's preparing a feast to celebrate his victory over death. To where that shroud is destroyed. Where it no longer covers over everything. Where it no longer blinds us to the truth of what's happening around us. Where it no longer keeps the reality of what's going on from us. Where we can see everything clearly for just as it is. Isaiah writes about this time. God's preparing a feast and victory. And he's inviting all peoples to come to him. To celebrate. It's telling, this passage tells us of a moment. Where the shroud ceased to exist. And where it is no more. So when is that time? And what does it have to do with Easter? It has absolutely everything to do with Easter. Absolutely everything. Because that day, that time where death no longer covers over everything, that time where death no longer has any power over us, the day for God's victory celebration is today. It is here and now because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, the Son of God, the great I Am, came and died on the cross so every single one of us here today could be forgiven of our sins. He died and was physically dead. He was wrapped in burial clothing. But on Easter Sunday, they went that tomb and they looked and they found the burial cloth folded up on that on that that death bench. And he wasn't there. Man. He defeated death in that moment. Yes. So death no longer has any power over us. It no longer has it has to have some control over our lives. But we have to be willing to repent and believe in him. You see, salvation through Jesus is your invitation to God's victory table. You are invited to come celebrate His victory, but you have to repent and believe in Jesus to get in. Accepting His invitation is the assurance that we will gather at the table with Him. You might be sitting there thinking, well, Pastor, what about the people that have died? You talk about death being the people who are still dying. But do you realize that because of what Jesus did at the cross, that death is just a stepping stone into eternal life? It's, it's no longer a period in someone's existence. It's a comma. It says, it says they died and then went to be with Jesus. They died and then they went to live forever. They died and they went up to those streets of gold and found the mansion that God had prepared for them. And when they got there, all the loved ones that had died and gone before them are there waiting for them. Death that separated them from the loved ones, death that, that shrouded over everything and blocked everything up has been removed. And so you can be in the presence of those you love again if you repent and believe in Jesus. Jesus took that old burial cloth, that old, that old thing, death, and wadded it up and placed it in his grave. 
Jesus put death in the grave. He started growing dirt on us. Said, you ain't never coming back again. You are done. You are finished. Your work here is over. If my people will just repent and believe in my name. Amen. Never again does the shroud of death have to cover over your life. So stop letting it. Stop letting it dictate the decisions you make. Stop letting it direct the courses that you take in your life. Instead, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith. Because he has saved you from death. All you have to do is repent and believe in him. That's why we're here. That's what we celebrate. That's what Easter's all about. It's all about the fact that death no longer has its grips on us. We no longer have to be afraid. But we can live in victory. I'm going to ask everybody to close their eyes and bow their heads this morning. Maybe you're here today and you've not experienced this victory in your life. Maybe that shroud of death looms over every decision you make. Maybe it's looming over situations in your life right now, and you say, you know what, I'm tired of having to have to say. I'm tired of letting it dictate how I live my life. I want to believe in Jesus this morning. That's you, just raise your hand. Amen, I see that one over there. If you want to, if you want to, to, to know that you'll be able to go and see your loved ones again, that death will no longer separate the two of you. You're saying, Pastor, I want to believe in Jesus today. Amen. Well, we're going to, we're going to close out in a, in a song that I'm going to play on, on the video here. And as this song plays, if you raise your hand and you, you want me to pray, if you just come forward. If, if you did raise your hand that the Lord's working on you and he's, he's saying, hey, I want you to come forward as the song plays, come up. Talk to him. Don't leave here this morning feeling defeated because of death's will on you. Leave here this morning knowing that it no longer has its talents upon you, that you are free.